Well, it's not. Um, since it's 930, I guess we can start or 1030, I should say. I'd like to make a formal objection, by the way, to having the Midwestern History Association held under Eastern time instead of Central time. Um, so we're here to discuss a new book that just came out. I think the paperback was issued um, a few weeks ago from Wisconsin Historical Society Press. And the title of that book is The Sower and the Seer, Perspectives on the Intellectual History of the American Midwest. The title comes uh, from a Liberty Hyde Bailey poem. Um, one of the chapters in the book is about Liberty Hyde Bailey, which I highly encourage you to read. He's a, an important uh, but forgotten Midwestern thinker. Um, I will introduce everyone here at the beginning because I need to, um, I just want to be cautious about getting zapped out of Zoom or something. So I'm going to give a brief introduction to everyone here at the beginning. Um, our first speaker is, uh, is going to be Andrew Seal, who is now a historian at the University of New Hampshire, but he is originally from Indiana, I hasten to point out, um, earned his PhD at Yale. And right at the beginning of the Midwestern History Association four or five years ago, well, no, I guess seven or eight years ago, Andrew was um, very interested and involved, and he was also interested in the revival of American intellectual history. And so at a conference um, at the Howenstein Center, we began talking about this interesting revival of both Midwestern and intellectual history at the same time. And those conversations um, during the um, during the cocktail hour at the Howenstein Center is what led to this book. Uh, many, many later. Um, anyway, I'll just say one more thing about uh, Andrew. He's working on a book about the history of the idea of the common man in American history, which I very much associate with the Midwest. So um, be on the lookout for that book in future years. He'll be our first speaker. Our second speaker probably needs no introduction to most people. He is was the long running director of the Howenstein Center, which made this conference possible. Thank you again for all your dedication to the conference leaves and starting us off. Uh, he's now head of the Ford Foundation um, there in Michigan, um, but he um, He's been behind many of our projects in Midwestern history and other projects in intellectual history. So he really is at the crossroads of this book. Um, our last speaker, um, I think another Indiana boy, if I could say it that way, grew up in Indiana, went to Hanover College and went to got his PhD at Indiana wow. University. Uh, that's Paul Murphy, also teaches at Grand State University where um, where the Howenstein Center is based. And Paul is also the author of a great uh, history of regional intellectual history um, about the Southern agrarians, which I encourage you to take a look at. So now if I'm successful here, I'll be able to just turn this over to Andrew and he can begin talking about this project and his chapter in the book um, about, about Cleveland. So, Go ahead, Andrew, if if you are able. Great. Can can you all hear me? Okay. Yes. Excellent. All right. <clears throat> so as as John just mentioned, um, this is now the the seventh time this conference has been held, and and since we skipped a year, uh, I guess that makes it eight years ago um, that that uh, it began. Um, and conveniently, my oldest child is, is also seven. So I've been thinking about that age. Um, and I have a few thoughts about what that age means for our common field of endeavor. Uh, for much of the past seven or eight years, um, we've been mostly focused, I think, on, on physical growth, marveling, you know, whether it's a child or, or um, Midwestern history as, as a field, marveling at the sheer persistence in time of this new organism and enchanted when others get to know of its existence. 
But at seven years, it becomes necessary to consider a few questions that go beyond how big or how tall. We feel that some philosophizing might be in order, some rumination on purpose and direction. How we set things moving in the right direction. We also grow increasingly concerned with the way our child treats others and with the way the child treats themselves. But perhaps most of all, we become concerned with relations of dominance and dependence, of leadership and loneliness, of attention and peripherality. Do others see the wonders that the parent sees or is the child ignored and excluded? Does the child stand up for themselves, or do they imitate others? Are they outgoing or introspective? Who are their friends? I'm speaking as, as one of the editors of, of a book that I think can be seen as, as one of the markers of Midwestern history's second stage of growth, a stage that is no longer predicated on proving the validity of our existence, but it increasingly engages with questions of how we want to interact with other fields. In The Sower and the Seer, we made what we argued was a natural connection. The Midwest has contributed a great deal to the intellectual history of the United States, and the historical study of ideas in America is richer for being reminded of the work that can still be done by focusing on the region. The other editors and I positioned our book as a rebuke to one of the longstanding stereotypes of Midwestern intellectual life, that it is mostly lived elsewhere and the boulevards of big cosmopolitan cities. We protested against the common assumption that the nation's interior states are excellent seedbeds for the germination of native geniuses, from T.S. Eliot to Jonathan Franzen, but a wasteland for their further growth. Instead, we argued that the Midwest has been more than a springboard for the illustrious careers of future expatriates. It has been a hospitable environment for the cultivation of extraordinary communities of intellectuals, for the cross-pollination of a diversity of ideas and for the harvesting more than a century of substantial in institutional growth. Now, if we had left off there with that assertion of our merits, that demand for attention, I think the sower and the seer would have had the spirit of the first stage of Midwestern history's growth. But here is where I think we try to take a necessary second step. It's not enough just to declare that we are important and should not be ignored. Boosterism may have its place, but it's not a very mature form of historiography. The question is no longer whether there is a Midwestern history worthy of being told. The question is now, what does telling that history do to others? What, what does uh, telling that history do, uh, sorry, what does telling that history to others do for them? Who do we want to be to others and for others? Or to put it somewhat more simply, if we have this story to tell, whom are we going to tell it to? Here are the next few sentences from our introduction. What is more, by attending to the intellectual bounty that remained at home in the region, we are better able to make visible and better able to recognize the significance of the multiple traditions and viewpoints that have staked their claim on the Midwest. The region only looks flat and monochromatic when we see it through the expatriate's eyes. From within, the contest of shifting interpretations over the very nature of the Midwest and its history, to some a frontier, to others a colonized space, uh, a breadbasket, um, uh, crossroads, a heartland, are readily apparent. The tensions between those interpretations, particularly as they are informed by questions of class, race, gender, indigeneity, are alive and evident in the pages of this collection. The point we wanted to make by insisting that there is something to be gained by refusing the expatriates' point of view was not just that ex-Midwesterners have been unfair to the region, but that the specific nature of their unfairness, depicting the, re 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 ha, depicting the region as culturally homogene homogeneous and spiritually monotonous, has tricked people both inside and outside the Midwest into thinking that Main Street is the only street in town if you want to find the variety or the diversity of American experiences, you're better off looking elsewhere. It's an idea of the Midwest as the product of a continual sorting process. Oddballs and geniuses might be born there, racial or sexual minorities might pass through there, but the only people who stay there are the nation's average people. It's mainstream, it's readers of Reader's Digest and buyers of Folger's Coffee. 
This is a pernicious myth, one that can be, to some degree, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Just yesterday, I read in my hometown newspaper that our high school basketball coach has taken a job with another school system. What was unusual about his departure was his candor about his reasons for leaving. He had been subjected to repeated harassment and abuse, much of it anonymous, from fans of the team who were unhappy that he was the coach. This wasn't competitiveness talking. He has been much more successful than any coach in a good long time. Instead, it was because of his religion. He is Muslim. While it may be a bit of a stretch to blame this particular situation on the myth of the monochrome Midwest, after all, prejudice exists everywhere, high school basketball in Indiana is thoroughly imbued with a deeply provincial worship of the small all-white town that is the very essence of that myth of homogeneity. Try to imagine, for example, if Hoosiers had starred not Gene Hackman as the coach, but Sidney Poitier or James Earl Jones. The trouble is it is far too easy, even for white historians for, to fall back on that image of the, even for historians uh, who happen to be white, to fall back on that image of the homogeneous small town as our default, even when we know better. To be a bit self-critical, that myth may even be part of why some of us are drawn to study the Midwest and its history in the same way that the soul of the Puritans anchors New Englanders and plantations remain central images of Southern history for some. I think you can see the small town's magnetic pull operating sporadically throughout the sower and the seer, deflecting our attention from the reality of a polyglot Midwestern middle ground, Richard White's famous name for a situation in which no culture is fully strong enough to dominate and eliminate others, and pulling us back to the smoother channel of the fictitious monoglot mainstream. To be quite frank, I'm not totally happy with the amount of diversity our book shows. For one thing, as you can see, the book's editors are all white men, a starting point that, although not at all intentionally, likely sent an undesirable message to potential contributors. The book contains essays that are in conversation with Native American history, Jewish American history, and the history of racial formation, and African American history, not to mention several that speak quite well to women's history, but all three of the essays that are explicitly about race are by white men. I'm responsible for one of them, and, and Michael Steiner, who's uh, in the room, uh, is responsible for another one, a very good one, um, part of his, his recent book on Horace Kaling. So why did this happen? Well, as anyone who has ever put together a conference or an edited collection or a job search can tell you, it's hard to recruit any person who hasn't already seen how they fit into the space you are inviting them to join. They either already think they belong in your space or they find it hard to picture being there. What does this mean? Well, I think it means that Midwestern history should neither wait for a more diverse set of scholars to come to it, nor should it trust that recruitment will be a sustainably effective strategy prevent, for preventing a continuous slide toward homogeneity, two steps forward, one step back. Instead, I think scholars who are passionate about Midwestern history, whatever their own background, need to engage more deeply with other historiographies, African-American history, Latinx history, the history of Asian Americans, the history of US imperialism and of immigration to the US, the histories of minority religions, LGBTQ history, Native American history, and follow those histories as they lead beyond our region's nebulous and much debated borders. Then we need to think about how we can bring our knowledge of the Midwest and share it with scholars in those fields, how we can help them see how a Midwestern angle might reveal a part of their project that they hadn't considered, how a connection to some facet of Midwestern culture opens up a new line of thought and insight. We are used to thinking, somewhat self-centeredly, I'd argue, of Midwestern history as a container for other histories, including all those that I mentioned just a moment ago. That makes it seem only natural that if, say, a scholar of African-American history is working on a project about Chicago or Minneapolis, they'll think of it in the same terms many of us would, as a history of African-Americans in the Midwest. But there is no reason why the inner and outer should not be flipped. Perhaps it would make more sense to think of it on a very different canvas, as a history of the Midwest, as just one point in the vast African diaspora. To initiate and hold up our end of a dialogue with that scholar then, 
we ought to become more accustomed to thinking of Midwest Midwestern history, not as a container, but to mix my metaphors here, as a tributary, as a flow of knowledge that we can connect to other people and their work, demonstrating what Midwestern history can bring to them. If we can do this tributary work well, it will become only too obvious to all kinds of scholars why they will belong as contributors to Midwestern history. They will be continuing the conversation that we started with them. And when that happens, we will know that most Midwestern, has, Midwestern history has passed not only the first stage of its growth, but is well on its way, far beyond even its second. Maturity means connection, not independence. And I look forward to an increasingly mature Midwestern history. Thank you. That was terrific, Andrew Gleaves Whitney here, the second speaker. And uh, I want to thank you for that terrific introduction, Andrew, to the sower and the seer. And thanks for the personal introduction, John Lauk. It's always an honor to share the stage with you both and with Paul, my good colleague over at Grand Valley. And I noticed that uh, Liz Wyckoff just joined us. She is the wonderful editor of the sower and the seer there at the Historical Society of Wisconsin. So Liz, I can't see you, but I'm I'm uh, applauding all of your hard work to make our volume sing. You really worked hard with us, and I think all of the editors greatly appreciate your efforts to make this, this book uh, a, a wonderful testament to where we are in the discipline. And more. I think the book has a soul in it. And um, it's today I'd like to speak to you about a man uh, about whom I wrote in chapter 18 of The Sower and the Seer man with a lot of soul, uh, Stephen Tonser III, whose dates were from 1923 to 2014. Tonser was just an interesting human being for so many reasons, but especially because of the numerous unresolved tensions in his life and thought. <clears throat> and really, they are the same kinds of tensions that are characterized in Liberty Hyde Bailey's fetching poem, Sower and Seer, after which the volume is titled. I, I think Tonser could be a poster child for that poem. His entire life was rooted in the Midwest, which covers a huge cultural and geographic swath, as Andrew just alluded to, you know, from uber modernist Chicago to the haunting wilderness of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. But of definitional importance here was that Stephen Tonser was born and raised in rural Illinois, in the river country around Jerseyville, just north of St. Louis. It's a small town life, camping with his grandmother along Sugar Creek. Uh, of course, he was not far from Springfield, and like so many Illinois children, he grew up cherishing the uh, lessons of Abraham Lincoln's life. But it was a hard scrabble life. Parents had to keep moving because they couldn't pay the grocers. And in the coldest weather, young Stephen had to walk to school. I get this, imagine this. He had to walk to school in his mother's shoes. They were that poor. And of course, there was a lot of humiliation in that as the other. Uh, boys in particular uh, would try to bully him. So he was eager to get an advanced education and get out of that area and improve his life. He went into the army after Pearl Harbor, won three bronze stars in the Pacific Theater, and he took advantage of the GI Bill at the end of the war and got all of his degrees at the University of Illinois, culminating in a PhD degree in 1955. And he spent 40 years teaching history at the University of Michigan. That's where he comes into my life. I mean, when I went to Michigan to go to grad school, he lived in a bungalow in Burns Park with his wife and four kids, the Burns Park neighborhood there in Ann Arbor, writing poetry himself, writing lyrically in letters to his best friend, the great Chicago publisher, Henry Regnatory, about you know hiking among the forested parklands and glacier moraines around this iconic college town. But in his heart, in his heart, he often went back to the Illinois River country around Jerseyville. And if you met him, you would think he was thoroughly Midwestern. And, and, and with that introduction to him, you might wonder if, if Tonser then taught Midwestern history. No, never, not once. Au contraire, his expertise was modern European intellectual history. And that's what he taught for four decades. And I would argue that what makes Tonser interesting, what makes his perspective interesting, his creative scholarship riveting, his intellectual and cultural life so enriched, was by this dialectic, this tension between his rootedness in the rural American Midwest 
where as a conservative Catholic, the traditions of his family were at home. That's what resided in his heart. Contrasted with the modern cosmopolitan de Racine European intellectual history where he lived in his intellect. And his whole life, it seems to me, was a, an attempt to resolve the tensions in that dialectic. But again, the Midwest was right at the core even of the way he thought about, as I say, cosmopolitan modern European intellectual history. So you think of these two poles, you know, the rural conservative American Midwest in his heart on the one side, the cosmopolitan modern European intellectual history in his intellect on the other side. In one day, you would hear his conversation. It would, it would, it would toggle back and forth between stories from his very Germanic upbringing, the traditionalist Catholic liturgy in rural Illinois, to the hermeneutics of suspicion in Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, or the Frankfurt School, or engaging with the Port Huron Statement as a young professor at Michigan, SDS when it started up in Michigan. In fact, one of his favorite students was Tom Hayden in his uh, intellectual history classes. So why is any of this interesting to us? Well, I think I would humbly offer because as a thinker, Tonser always factored in at least the two poles, and of course, with, when you have two poles, you're really talking about three elements. You're talking about the left pole, the right pole, and the tension between them. And those of you who know my work at the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies all those years and my work currently as Executive Director of the Ford Presidential Foundation, you know that I'm fascinated by that tension between the two extremes, because that's where history is really made. Not off with the ideologues of the extreme left, not off with the ideologues of the extreme right, but in the tension in the middle. So every polarity has those three fields. And <clears throat> because as a thinker, taunts are always factored in these, the two poles and the, the field, the, the tension between them. It became his, I think his meta method as it were. And, and that's what resulted in his rich perspective about thinking about all sorts of things. Now, when I was preparing to move to Ann Arbor and pursue doctoral study under Tonser's direction in the 1980s, I discovered this method, this metaphysic almost, that he had developed by the mid-1960s. He called it the organic reconciliation of opposites. It was shorthand for how he approached inquiry, ordered understanding, and developed rhetorical strategies. And this concept runs like a golden thread through many of the essays he produced. And if the concept of organic reconciliation of opposites needed an introduction, Tantzer would look to political philosophy and especially to the founder of fusionism, Frank Meyer. Tantzer regarded Meyer as a mentor. They spent countless hours on the phone in the 1960s, always, alas, at dinner time to the consternation of his wife, Caroline. Meyer endeavored to find common ground among diverse schools of thought. He could do so because as Tantzer wrote, he, quote, is a great debater who had first debated within himself every idea that he publicly defended or opposed. He is such a worthy combatant because every issue which he confronts publicly has first been fought out as a civil war within himself, close quote. Meyer saw that these interior battles were reflected in the movement's external battles, especially between those between libertarians and, and Catholic traditionalists and socialists. You know, for people who understand the history of the conservative movement, there's actually among the traditionalist conservatives a real link, not only attention with libertarianism on the one side, but Catholic social teaching on the other, which is almost, well, it's a communitarian quasi, at times socialist uh, school of thought. Meyer was fascinated in the interplay of these, as was Tonser. So when you say, oh, he was just a right-wing thinker, totally misses really the nuances and the battles within him, just as uh, misses the nuances and the battles within Frank Meyer, his mentor. So he, Tonser spent his professional life and his, his writing and his teaching of generations of students, tried to bring harmony to freedom and order, innovation and tradition. They are not irreconcilable antitheses in his view. Rather, they need each other by very definition. If you say freedom immediately, it's freedom from what, freedom to what. Order is automatically invoked. So, you know, you need these polarities to form a humane polity in which to live. And Tonser was committed to the intellectual project, the intellectual task of yoking them together in a fusion. 
could build a movement. And that's what made him, like his mentor, Frank Meyer, a fusionist. Let me just, uh, one more point. Um, Stephen Tonser was a great poet himself in his own quiet way. Uh, his poems were striking. Uh, he was a lover of the modernist poets. And again, this belies the thought that he's just some you know, right-wing conservative. Um, he had, um, in fact, one of his early, he, he also went through a period when he was gay in his early life. And um, his lover was a, a, an incredible poet. And together they would read about the organic reconciliation of opposites, sort of a pointing to Walt Whitman and that famous line, which was almost a, and those of you who know Whitman's poetry probably know this line. It's a beautiful line. Do I contradict myself? Very well then I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. You know, that could have been Tonser's storyline. I mean, he, his tagline, he acknowledged his debt to the romantic appreciation of the dialectic of opposites and of polarities. And when he studied poetry at the University of Illinois as an undergraduate, he steeped himself in the sensibilities of Whitman and the romantics because it was they who expressed eloquently and frequently this profound observation that the essence of life is polarity, opposition, contradiction, and that these, when integrated, if there's an attempt to harmonize and synthesize these, these warring factions in the, in the personality, in, in our larger institutions, in our society, enrich and, and energize a larger context of which they're a part. So that's really uh, my main message. Uh, that's what I wanted to, to explore in the chapter. I would refer you to this, this wonderful book that Liz helped us put together as uh, editors. And um, I, I think that you would find the, the richness in it. And Tonser is just one aspect of that, but I think his method is, is something that, that tells you about the book writ, writ large. Um, this golden thread running through Tonser's early work shows that the Michigan historian belonged to really a great, a larger civilizational tension, not just in the West, but it's in the East as well. Uh, this, this effort, this Herculean, if not Sisyphean task to, to reconcile opposites. Uh, you know, Tonser believed that given that human beings were, were, had aspirations, but were framed by limitations, there'd always be this dynamic tension between, you know, God and humanity, faith and reason, the absolute and the relative, the, the universal and the particular, unity and diversity, Jerusalem and Athens, liberty and order the work of trying to reconcile so that we can live together is never finished. Yet to strive, Tonser believed this, that to strive for that re recognition is ennobling. He said, I'm quoting now, my behavior would be less honorable and my world more impoverished were I to abandon any one of these contradictory ideals. Well, look at it. Our book promised to offer, if you read the subtitle, Perspectives of the Intellectual History of the American Midwest. And I'd offer that Stephen Tonser's perspective, his understanding of the existential polarities of the human condition, is as old as Genesis and Heraclitus on the one hand, and as new as quantum mechanics and cognitive behavioral therapy on the other. It all goes back to the Middle West, the very term middle between maybe these Eastern European cosmopolitan institutions, then they're mediated, and then you got the frontier on the other side. And we, maybe we're all Middle Westerners in that sense. We're all struggling between sort of the, the cosmopolitan, the global, and the very particular, and even a, an unknown and mysterious wildness in which we're surrounded. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glees, and, and thanks everybody for attending. If I see my bars are going down, so if there's any problems in hearing me, let, let me know. Um, and I wanted to uh, show the book uh, because not only is there a lot of pleasure to be gained from this book um, because there's such great knowledge in it, terrific essays, but it's also a very pleasant book to look at. So you can, you can pull the book off the shelf and you can, um, Know, uh, read it and learn, but also you can uh, contemplate the cover and, 
uh, you know, have Midwestern and poetic thoughts. So it's a real pleasure to be involved in this project as well. So I, I prepared a, a few remarks. Um, when Jane Adams founded the pioneering social settlement that soon came to be known as Hull House with her friend Ellen Gates Starr in the west side of Chicago in 1889, she was determined to create an institution where young men and women could socialize their democracy, quote unquote. The meaning of socialize and democracy at that time uh, was quite ambiguous, but Adams' Adams's intent was that people from different social classes and nationalities should develop relationships based on mutual respect and equality. The Anglican cleric Samuel Barnett and his wife Henrietta Barnett, whom Adams had befriended in London, provided her a crucial model in Toynbee Hall in the East End. There, young college men lived among the poor inhabitants of the Whitechapel district and pursued socialistic goals of alleviating want, but also intended simply by mingling with working class folk to impart their own cultural ideals and foster democratic social relations. To break down barriers, Henrietta Barnett observed, quote, people must talk together. The Italian nationalist Giuseppe Mazzini's suggestion that democracy begins when a man can, quote, commune as intimately as possible with the greatest possible number of his fellows, unquote, end of quote, also inspired Adams. Hull House became one of the most influential centers of progressive, progressive social reform in the nation, if not the world, and Adams a quintessential progressive reformer. Adams thought of the settlement as embracing the quote, Western American uh, approach to social class, meaning a more egalitarian and less elitist approach. She had grown up in the small town of Cedarville, Illinois, and attended a female seminary in nearby Rockford. It is in this Midwestern locale that she developed the impulse to socialize for democracy. But as can be seen, neither she nor the Midwest was isolated or disconnected from the rest of the world. There are many themes that emerge from the 22 essays that comprise the sower and the seer. And this is surely one of them. In the transformative years, the late 19th and early 20th century, the Midwest emerged as a dynamic and progressive region of the country, rivaling the Northeast. It also became a place of cultural, intellectual, and religious ferment, a crossroads of reform ideas, as well as of people. As Brian Ingracia suggests in his essay in the pioneering urban uh, planner, Charles Mulford Robinson, the quote, progressive era Midwest was both an exceptional and unexceptional place, a region where people borrowed ideas from around the world to improve their cities and potentially provide an example for everyone else. So I wanna come back to that point, but I'll make another point about intellectual history as a field first. The last couple of decades has, been, has seen a revival in the field of US intellectual history. The study of the history of ideas in the European context can be traced to the 19th century, but the study of intellectual history in the US really blossomed in the mid 20th century. At that time, intellectuals as a distinct class were new on the scene, relatively new, and possessed, I would say, a rather high appraisal of their significance in American society. In the first half of the 20th century, a range of cultural critics in and out of academia, from historians like James Harvey Robinson and Charles Beard, to philosophers such as John Dewey, to literary critics like Lewis Mumford or Henry Nash Smith or Howard Mumford Jones, tended to define American civilization in terms of ideas as a set of ideas. Implied in this notion was the assumption that Americans shared a unified mind. This conception was tied into projects of cultural reform, such as that advanced by the young intellectuals of the 19 teens and 20s, including Van White Brooks who called for a cultural history that would foster cultural renewal. In 1918, he declared that the, quote, spiritual welfare of this country depends altogether upon the fate of its creative minds, which were, he felt, starving for, quote, new ideals, the finer attitudes. They lacked the resources they needed to ripen. They existed in, he said, a void due to the fact that the past, quote, the past that survives in the common mind of the present is a past without living value. The task of the critic was to step into this void and, as he said, invent a usable past. As his fellow young intellectual, Waldo Frank argued, America was a conception to be created. 
The American Studies Movement, linking the study of American lit and history emerged in the 1930s and generated new types of courses, such as Yale's American Thought and Civilization. The heyday of American studies lasted through uh, the 1960s. As with much else, however, the, the revolutionary cultural explosions of the 60s transformed academia, including American studies and American intellectual history. The, assumptions of a unit, the assumption of a unitary mind no longer made sense to a profession newly focused on the historical marginalizations of millions of, of American citizens. The civil rights movement, black nationalism, other cultural nationalist movements echoed the early 20th century project of the young intellectuals to foster a usable past that would advance cultural freedom. But the object now was no longer an American nationalism, but a history that would recover the lost past of African-Americans, uh, the Chicanos or the Chicano movement at the time, Mexican-Americans, Asian-Americans, uh, Native Americans. The aim was cultural and social freedom, not a renewed, Amer not a renewed national American culture. The movement drew great support in American universities and colleges and demanded a more pluralistic history. Women's history also took on new life. As a discipline, historians turned first to social history and then influenced by postmodern attention to the power of language, a cultural history focused on discourses. Key assumptions and approaches in the older intellectual history, including the big assumption that an American mind defined in terms of the writings of dead white males explained America, went out the window. Intellectual historians struggled to redefine their field in various ways, shifting, for example, to a focus on the social history of intellectuals or on discursive communities or on the institutions and agencies by which ideas are shared. Uh, for example, the history of the book, history of medium. And, and that, you know, such results uh, bore great fruit. Um, these projects bore great fruit, I should say, in the last but in the last 20 years, the self-defined field of intellectual history has reemerged as a fruitful means of pulling together work about thinkers active in the US broadly conceived. A good marker of the field's resurgence is the establishment of the Society for US Intellectual History in 2011, an organization with a Midwestern pedigree, I might add, as one of its key movers was a young Midwestern scholar who earned her PhD at Loyola University in Chicago. Uh, and plenty of other Midwesterners involved. <laughs> uh, the hallmark of the field is its openness to a variety of methods, subjects, and approaches, and an aversion to boundaries, national, whether national, theoretical, methodological, <clears throat> excuse me, or otherwise, that might inhibit intellectual work. Uh, sushi, as some of us say, uh, conferences that brought together scholars working in religious history, the history of education, African-American history, women's history, the history of philosophy, art history, literary history, the history of science, international relations, various subfields. Midwestern history itself, a newly revived field, uh, thanks to some of the people on this panel, uh, is I think a welcome addition. And I think this book uh, uh, takes a step towards making that clear. To return to, my, to return to my earlier point, the essays in The Sower and the Seer suggest to me the important role the Midwest played in the age of progressive reform that produced the first generation of those 20th century critics. We should think of the progressive era as generative, not just of social and political reform, but also of powerful movements of cultural rebellion and reform. In a previous uh, volume edited by my colleagues, John Lauk and Gleaves and, and Joe Hogan, who can't be here, finding a new Midwestern history, Michael Steiner suggested that the Middle West as a self-identity, as well as American regionalist thought itself emerged in the progressive era. The Midwest, Frederick Jackson Turner could proclaim, quote, holds the balance of power in the nation. It was, quote, the keystone of the American Commonwealth, quote, the economic and political center of the Republic. The sheer dynamism of the progressive era Midwest is evident in the sower and the seer. In the essay previously cited by Brian and Gracia, we see Charles Mulford Robinson bringing the city beautiful principles of urban planning along with progressive interest in efficiency and a cooperation to small Midwestern cities in the first two decades of the 20th century. Kenneth Wheeler touches on the centrality of the Midwest to the creation of a modern consumer-driven economy. While Wheeler documents the trepidation felt by Midwestern authors such as Sinclair Lewis, Robert Lind, and Ross Lockridge Jr., he points out that other Midwesterners like Montgomery Ward, Richard Sears, Albert Roebuck, as well as, of course, 
Henry Ford were at the forefront of the transformation in retail and mass production. Progressivism entailed a wide ranging effort to apply the fruits of reason to improve the conditions of life for everyone and address the new social inequities and injustices of which Americans were increasingly aware in all domains of life. Progressive reformers were broadly democratic, even if, as with Adams, they understood democracy in social and cultural as much as political terms. The progressive impulse manifested itself, too, I would argue, in, in cultural terms. And there was a strong evangelical streak as well. In short, progressivism was a broad-based and totalizing ethos. Proponents of this reform active in the, uh, consider, I should say, Carrie Alcorn's essay on the movement for rural school con consolidation. Proponents of this reform active in the Midwest, O.J. Kern, Harold Faux, uh, Elwood Coverley, Mabel Carney, these are the folks she uh, emphasizes, reflected advanced national educational reform thought. The Midwest intellectually was deeply connected to the latest national and international trends in thought. However, Alcorn also suggests a lively empiricing cultural analysis active in these thinkers. Kern and Fote presented urban America as, they say, as devitalized. Both used a version of that term, devitalization. A judgment with which someone like Lewis Mumford would certainly concur. They wanted progress, but they did not want to lose the values they associated with healthy rural communities. This is not unlike Robinson's vision for Midwestern cities in which public buildings should be grouped together at the quote, center of the progressive body politic, uh, as Ingracia says, quote, increasing civic pride and facilitating cooperation. The prickly radicalism of prairie populism survived at the University of Nebraska in figures like the historian John Hicks, who William Pratt tells us transmitted it to one of his students, Mary Sandoz, who went on to become a major Midwestern regionalist. Hicks moved from Nebraska to the University of Wisconsin, which is a storied center of American progressivism itself. Michael Steiner points out that the energetic young pragmatist and Zionist philosopher Horace Callan, longing for his beloved Boston and East Coast culture, was decidedly mixed in his feelings about his new tenure track appointment. But he found the Midwest awash in progressive ideas, people, and movements in the 19 teens and became himself another node connecting the young intellectual, anti-war dissident and devoted Greenwich, Greenwich Village bohemian Randolph Bourne to his peer in all uh, of these traits, although I guess less a young intellectual than simply a village socialist, Max Eastman, remarkably in his apartment in Madison. <laughs> Those two uh, Greenwich Village bohemians met in Madison, Wisconsin for the first time. Callan demonstrates well the essential cultural dimension of progressivism, including Midwestern progressivism. Midwesterners had a tradition uh, of the development of the mind, a careful crafting of a usable past, a deep concern for the spiritual welfare of the country and its common values, even in such humble forms as the Cedar Falls Horticultural and Literary Society, uh, which reflects so wonderfully the original meaning of culture careful tending of the new shoot so that it grows strong. Quote, the mind and the soil is our platform and we would make a thorough business of each could we have our way, claimed its founder, Peter Melendi. Callan had good reason to commune with Bourne and Madison for they shared the desire to repudiate the melting pot and reimagine an increasingly immigrant dominated America as an international nation a quote, rather cosmopolitan federation of national colonies, foreign cultures, from whom the sting of devastating competition has been removed. Born envisioned a transnational culture. Callan called this cultural pluralism. And Steiner argues Callan's conceptualization of it evolved out of his travels throughout the Midwest, tirelessly advocating for the Zionist cause and in the process finding a new society of strong, deeply ethnic communities interacting with each other in a healthy plural, pluralistic fashion. I don't know, Mike, and Michael can tell us if I'm reading too much <laughs> into that. As William Russell Coyle points out in his essay on Mr. Republican Robert Taft, the Midwest was far from static and many in the Midwest were new people 
deeply modern folks who had uprooted themselves to start a new life thousands of miles from their homeland. The rural Midwest was heavily immigrant. In responding to the chauvinism and anti-Semitism of his distinguished colleague, the sociologist Edward A. Ross, Callan drew on the Midwestern example of a cosmopolitan, polyglot, tolerant modernity. When Bourne made the great democratic claim that native born Americans had no greater claim to ownership of American culture than the most, even the most recent immigrant, and that was his claim, that priority of immigration should not give any person a greater cultural vote than another, he would, if Steiner is right, be reflecting a bit of Midwestern progressivism. And although treating Charles Grandison Finney, the great anti-Calvinist evangelical so influential in the early uh, 19th century, William Cost Levy's point in his essay is to suggest the deep influence of a liberal Protestantism that could unite activism for social justice and a concern for cultural reform, albeit of the temperance and Sabbath observing variety. Notions of conservatism and progressivism become mixed in Cost Levy's analysis as he shows how the fire of evangelical zeal and Christian perfectionism can lead one to the social gospel and to cultural conservatism, even unto perhaps George McGovern, the Methodist minister, who although perhaps not a Sabbatarian, exhibited as the late Johnny e. Miller points out a type of moral clarity and bedrock decency that was profoundly Midwestern. He was a later inheritor, uh, inheritor of the progressive Midwest and Ray Boomhauer's essay, I should point out on John Barlow, um, John Martin Barlow, maybe I'm getting his name wrong, Barlow Martin, uh, another late inheritor. In finding a new Midwestern history, that volume uh, uh, co-edited by some of our colleagues here, James Seaton presented Midwestern intellectuals and Midwestern values as essentially conservative. Although to be fair, not in any simple way as his examples of Midwestern conservatives included Kenneth Rexroth and Deirdre McCloskey, as well as Russell Kirk. Gleaves' enlightening essay on Stephen Tonser presents a true blue conservative to be sure, although as Gleaves just said, rather complicated one. Um, uh, it seems to be fundamentally uneasy with authority, for example. Alan Carlson presents a radical conservative in John Raw, a good specimen of the manly Jesuit, uh, yet one who combined conservative Catholic values with anti-capitalist agrarians. Today, much of the rural Midwest is a bastion of red America. We who have driven a bit out of the cities see the Trump flags fluttering. I was driving through a uh, Ohio city and I saw a Trump flag next to a big, a rather large flag that said F-bomb Biden on someone's front porch. Yet I am not so sure Midwestern values are fundamentally conservative in the ways we think, either in the conventional republicanism of Robert Taft who defined G GOP orthodoxy for the post-World War II era, freedom should never be sacrificed for the sake of security. That's, that's also a Reagan statement from the 60s, or the raging Buchanan style pre trumpite paleo conservatism of the aging tonser. The Midwest embraced the free thinker Robert G. Ingersoll, for goodness sakes, as much as it could adopt Dwight Moody, as Justin Clark teaches us in his essay. Writing of progressive era Indiana, the liberal newspaperman and political operative John Bartlow Martin called it a golden age, a time of fine literature, invention, and constant renewal. The constant renewal was his phrase. His hero was the socialist labor organizer, Eugene Debs. It's interesting to think of the political, social, and cultural dynamism of the Midwest at that time. In the 20th century, culture became commercialized and centralized in New York City and the great Eastern and Western, and sometimes Midwestern universities in Hollywood. Pockets of commercial culture could arise, Motown uh, in the 60s or Nashville and Austin in music today. As we know, young Midwestern authors, including Mary, San Mary Sandoz, as we learned in the Sower and the Seer, famously migrated to the Metropole in the, in the 20th century and never came back except to visit and lecture. Why exactly did Americans so easily embrace a homogenized, centralized national culture? It surely was not what Bourne, Brooks, or Callan, or so many of the subjects of the essays in the Sower and the Seer wanted. Midwesterners eagerly embraced progressive ideas. They were aware of the ideas of European thinkers like Giuseppe Mazzini and Samuel and Henrietta Barnett and gave back fresh adaptations in turn as Jane Addams did. 
At the same time, they sought to preserve a civic life instead of values they associated with the Midwest. They wanted modernity on their own terms, but often failed to achieve it. Perhaps there was no way to resist the juggernaut of consumer capital capitalism successfully, as Kenneth Wheeler hints in his essay. But as the authors of this volume indicate, many try. The author's work suggests too, I think, that there are many more questions to be answered in Midwestern intellectual history. And with that, I'll turn it back, I'll turn this back to Gleep, uh, to uh, Jeff. Thanks, Paul, much appreciated. Uh, we'll open it up here for discussion in a second. Um, I wanted to uh, offer two thoughts, real quick thoughts. Uh, number one, um, Paul was talking about the mid 20th century explosion of interest in American intellectual history. And I really can't think of anybody who was more central to that whole movement than Merle Curdy of Papillion, Nebraska, and uh, who, who took his roots there seriously. Um, I dug into the Curdy papers a bit for uh, a book I did on early Midwestern historians. And I do think there's a lot more to be learned about Curdy. Um, and that kind of leads me to my second point. And I hope Elizabeth is still on this call because we really need a second volume on this whole topic of thinkers and intellectuals who emerged out of the Midwest and how the Midwest shaped them because um, we only scratched the surface. As we were editing this volume, I kept thinking of more and more people we should have talked about and more and more chapters we should have had. Um, and my third point is if there are any uh, young, ambitious graduate students listening to this session today, I do think a great volume would be um, bringing together all these threads and writing an old fashioned, um, but with new, with all the new, um, with all the new developments incorporated, an old fashioned intellectual history of the Midwest that could be called the Midwestern mind or something uh, that brought these threads together but you need you know three years to do this you need um, a phd program to allow you to focus to bring all this together but it's sitting there waiting to be done uh, the original title of this uh, book was supposed to be uh, mapping midwestern minds um, and you know to bring in that old idea of uh, the american mind or uh, intellectual history or what people thought about uh, in a particular group and how they influenced each other. Um, with that, uh, let's open it up for questions. I guess how this works is people can uh, just speak up if I understand correctly. But remind them to unmute themselves if they're going to speak up. Oh yes. Uh, please unmute your phones if you're uh, going to ask a question. Well, maybe people don't know the exact logistics of this. So let me just uh, go back. We'll start at the beginning with um, John, Andrew. Jo Joellen has a question. Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> this is this is relatively specific, but um, while Paul was talking, I was thinking about my own um, education and intellectual history at the University of Iowa with Stowe Persons and Sherman Paul, et cetera. In Grand Rapids, uh, well, I met Constance Rourke before I ever moved to Grand Rapids. She lived here, but does she? Oh. Um, the work that I've done on Constance Rourke in past decades has shown that her ideas have been everywhere in the last 30 or 40 years in American intellectual history, but she is rarely credited. So I've just wondered what's happened to her. And in case you're not aware of her, Van Wick Brooks, um, when, when Rourke died, she hit her head on the ice um, when she was 55 years old in 1941. Van Wick Brooks pulled together her enormous work in progress 
and it was published as Roots of American Culture. It's a little bit scattershot, but she did really important work. She was the godmother of American studies. I believe their best essay is still awarded in her name every year, but I see her name less and less. Where is she in all this? Well, uh, I'll just, I mean, I, I've learned a lot about Constance's work from you and, and uh, I've read a bit of Constance's work, but I, I would say she belongs in this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think she plays a great role in understanding um, American cultural criticism in the, in the 1930s and after. She has the terrific book uh, on American humor. Um, I think of her as a regionalist thinker, so maybe Michael Steiner has something to say. So, um, so I say uh, she she needs an essay in in any future book of this kind, Michael. Well, I just just um, she wrote a wonderful essay on proletarian regionalism, I believe, and she she talked about the revolution taking place not just in the lofts of Greenwich Village, but also in the factories of you know Grand Rapids and um, Chicago. Uh, it's a terrific essay. Um, can't remember the exact title of it. So um, she was a remarkable person. And who wrote the, the one biography that- uh, Joan had, Shelley Rubin. There you go. It's There's so, actually another biography. I can't remember who wrote it. It was in the yeah. 20th series. The fellow American studies person, I mm -hmm. believe, Joan Shelley Rubin. Yeah. So yeah, so good for you. We, we really need, need her name brought back. We really do. But, yeah, Paul, I wouldn't call her regional, even though she did haunt um, Michigan in particular. And she published, I think, I think published the first accounts of John Bunyan stories and that kind of thing. And she interviewed a lot of ship captains on uh, like the late Great Lakes. But most of her work, like American humor, is not regional at all. Um, it's very national. Um, oh, yeah, no, I agree. But I, I thought of her as sort of um, someone who, um, you know, was tracing an American folk culture and was aware of the regional roots of different uh, different strains of American culture. But oh, sure. I stand I'm happy to be corrected by you about on that matter. <laughs> yeah, I know um, there's a wonderful series of books that are reprinted by the New York Review of Books. Um, and it's, uh, it's a terrific looking uh, series because they have these very colorful spines and so you can line them up on your bookshelf. Uh, and they reprinted um, American Humor uh, early on in the series. Um, but I, I think that, so, I mean, they obviously recognized her as, as a lost and neglected voice. Um, they've published others in a similar vein, George R. Stewart and some other uh, kind of folklorists and, and so forth. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, uh, that she remains kind of, um, I mean, I, I was in the American Studies PhD program and, and um, it wasn't uh, required reading. Um, I, found her on my own. Um, so I, I think that uh, the, the legacy is there to be picked up. I, I do want to, one just last comment. Grial Marcus, of all people, introduced the, um, that new um, version of American humor. Right. May I ask you a question of Bleaves? Bleaves, do you mind if I ask you a question on Stephen Tonser? That's fine. I, found your essay fascinating um you know the personal details you revealed about his life and and the knowledge you had and i was and i've known him you started your essay with the anecdote that he sort of denounced uh, um, as a paleo conservative he denounced the neoconservatives and I, I actually you suggest that that was really damaging to him as a as a national figure My, and you also suggest i i think that when you encountered tonsert he had sort of become a more narrow thinking, perhaps ideologically driven conservative. Um, but I wanted to, do you have any insights on that? Because I mean, in some sense, doesn't he, his projections sort of track um, some dimension of the American right. Uh, when you look at a uh, kind of Reaganite conservatism defined by certain attitudes, you know, foreign policy and um, domestic policy. Um, but that kind of rise of a, you know, some would call it an ethno-nationalist sort of conservatism or maybe a kind of a deeply cultural conservatism marked by alienation from contemporary cultural trends. Do you know what happened to him, why it happened to him, and do you think his story is indicative of some larger story on the right? Well, I think you're onto something there, Paul. I, I often thought, you know, that the early tonsor that I explored before I applied to go to the University of Michigan grad school program there in history, 
was a tonsor who was very dynamic in his thinking, as, as I point out, and as you suggest. And I think a lot of his bitterness arose in the fight uh, between the, now this is where it gets really interesting. I, I wanna first of all qualify, the first woman he loved and he fell in love with was a Jewish woman. It's the daughter of, of Fritz Stern, you know, so a famous refugee who was at, uh, at, um, at uh, Harvard. Uh, and she, she they, they met as undergraduates and he never forgot her. Every time he went back to Boston, he would find a way to go see Rose. And um, I think the charge that Tonser was anti-Semitic is belied by that, by his, his love for Rose. He had a very complicated love life. I don't wanna go into all the details here, but so later when he stands up and he says he's upset with the neocons, part of it I think was just professional jealousy. The neocons were well-funded and they were very successful at placing people uh, you know, in, into professional positions. And I think that that's, that's something that Tonser students tended not to land the prestigious, great positions at Ivy League universities and in Washington, DC. A lot of the neocons did. And, and I think it enraged Tonser at a certain level. And it made him come across as anti-Semitic, but I don't think he was. So that's one point that I think is sort of, we're dancing around is when we talk about the evolution or the devolution in his thinking. Um, he had really nasty letter exchanges with uh, Werner Danhausen, for example, you know, the great uh, Jewish uh, intellectual historian philosopher, um, I believe he was at uh, Cornell, and um, he had these, these nasty exchanges that you can find if you go to his papers at the Hoover Institution. So again, I, I think it became very personal and very professional with him. Um, and it, it would, I, I think as he got older, as he got into his 60s, when I met him in the 1980s, he had grown tired of some of these battles. Remember, he had been battling the new left. I mean, sort of in a in a very gamey sort of way there on campus. Tom Hayden, as I say, was a student, but I think he just got more and more tired. The weariness of life and these battles set in as his students did not get the plum jobs and it made him come across as, as more um, rigid, I guess. More, um, more paleo and less neo. But I, I think, does he anticipate some of the uh, things that were going to happen, say, in the age of Trump, which I think our question is dancing around? Um, I definitely think people like to read the later Tonser in that light, but there was still the spark in him that was always nonconformist, that was always spitting into the wind. Uh, he was a very combative individual, and I, I think he would have been repulsed by Trump, totally. We'll never know. He died in 2014. Does that answer your question, Paul? Yeah, yeah, no, he's, he's, just, a, he's just a very fascinating fellow. I really appreciated learning more about him from your wrestling. Thank you. Um, can I just uh, toss out a couple thoughts here? I wanted to mention, um, since you mentioned uh, this aspect of Tonser and since Michael Steiner, who's on this call, has this uh, brilliant new book about Horace Callan, which everyone should take a look at, and the early roots of American pluralism, I wanted to mention that uh, we have an upcoming issue of the journal Middle West Review focused on the Jewish Midwest and some of the prominent intellectuals who came out of the Midwest. So keep an eye out for that down the road. Um, also wanted to comment on uh, Joellen's uh, mentioning of Constant Rourke, who's from Cleveland, but I did not know, and this I guess there's not a, a more Midwestern way to die than to fall on the ice and, uh, and uh, pass away that way. 
but she should be in this uh, second volume. Obviously, Constant, Constance Rourke was an incredible part of uh, the Midwestern intellectual tradition. Uh, but lastly, I just wanted to follow up on uh, a conversation that Andrew started, and maybe Paul, if you could take this question first. Um, Andrew says, uh, we're no longer in the early childhood stage. We've passed preschool. We're into, I guess, late elementary school in terms of uh, the growth of uh, Midwestern history as a field or regrowth. Um, we've en entered a second stage of the growth of the field, um, as Andrew puts it. I wonder what you think about that, Paul. How do you size up uh, that argument? Uh, I think it's a <laughs> it's a really um, intriguing image. I mean, it's it's funny, right? Because we think there um, there was a Midwestern history. Um, I think you make this point, John. So I don't know if that's reincarnation or what's going on, but it's a, it's a seven year old who has some sort of memory of what came before. Um, but I think that's right. I think there's a there's a time. Um, the analogy is that there's a time of growth and development. I think the Catholic Church used to say seven years is the age of reason, isn't it? When you can start be guilty of sin, I guess. But, but there is a time. Uh, uh, there's a time in a field when you're when you're you're sort of filling in things, right? You're 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 getting the story out. You're you're recovering and discovering, and you're 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 finding and uh, uh, you're making archives and you're digging out what can be found in these archives. And I think that that a lot of that has been going on. But I, but I can see now this is the time when we should be looking towards that, maybe not the, maybe not just the history of the mind of the Midwest, but the history of the Midwest, the synthetic accounts, the, the ways in which we can tie some of what we started to discover to, to some bigger and larger themes. I don't know what you think, Andrew, about that. Well, um, my, uh, my kids just uh, walked in the door, so um, I'll, they, they might be... Uh, very able to address the, the seven-year-old issue. But um, I, actually, I see Andrew Klump has his hand up, so I, I'd like to pass it off to him. Oh, um, I just had a, I had a different question. So if you want to answer that question, uh, go ahead. I just wanted to try to get a question in because I saw the 10-minute warning come oh, up. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess my my thought um, and, and the, the uh, Catholic Church um, circling of, of the uh, age of seven as, as the age of conscience. Um, yeah, there's a famous Jesuit saying that giving a child before uh, they turn seven and, and you know, I'll give you the man. Um, that you, you have to get uh, to the, their sort of uh, moral formation before the age of seven. But uh, so that, that was in the back of my head, uh, back of my mind. But um, I guess my, my thought is, is, is precisely uh, like you said, that um, trying to get the, the broad outlines of the story down, uh, trying to, to map out um, some of the, the parameters of, of what we, I mean, you know, there's uh, always a, a sort of boundary setting, um, literally in, in our case, because uh, you know, none of us has quite the same map of the Midwest in mind when we uh, use that, uh, that, that noun. Um, and so just getting some of those field clearing questions out and um, either passing on from them or, or coming to some kind of uh, detente, um, you know, whether, uh, you know, Appalachia, I, I think um, uh, Joellen mentioned in, in, um, in the question, um, is, is part of the Midwest or to what degree it is. Um, those kind of questions are, are really important um, as you know, identity forming. Um, but I think that increasingly, I, I hope that Midwestern historians can be pursuing you know, connections with other fields, um, and uh, you know, that we'll all be going to, to conferences and bringing our Midwestern history um, to conferences elsewhere, um, and then you know bringing friends back with us um, next year. Um, that, that's sort of the 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 program that, that I would like to see us pursue. Um, and I, I do feel that that is a sort of second stage of, of growth. I have a comment if you're uh, ready. Uh, my name is Steve Kasoulis. I'm uh, gonna be presenting later on and uh, tomorrow. Uh, I'm interested in the uh, 
local and regional history, grassroots history, uh, and I'm uh, exploring the uh, lesser known ethnic communities of South Dakota going back to 1897, the Greeks, the Jews, the Syrians, and so on, Italians, Chinese. And uh, my own uh, reading of Midwest history is a basically is a, a crazy quilt of different ethnic groups, uh, different political issues and concerns. Uh, Minnesota itself, you have uh, a crazy quilt within that state. And to make the broad generalizations about the nature of the Midwest in terms of values, I think is very difficult uh, in culture. And I don't think uh, we've explored much about the, uh, the uh, nature of, of our uh, Midwest uh, area if we don't know much about the specific uh, regional uh, uh, areas, uh, South Dakota, for example. Did you know that South Dakota was the, uh, that the music of choice in South Dakota from 1919 to 1939 was jazz? There were no polka music. There were no country and Western. Uh, and the jazz music was not uh, core Midwest values, were they? Uh, not that I know of. No, I came from Richmond, Indiana, Indiana, which in is the mainline churches. Uh, at First jazz. Baptist Church, uh, you would have uh, Wagner in the services and Mendelssohn. So the church music was all what I'd call European Eastern music. And in clothing and uh, uh, that uh, the city named Hur uh, Huron, small, I don't remember the uh, population, 2000, had about eight or nine, 10, 12 clothing stores, all featuring New York fashions in 1927. And then Deadwood. Deadwood was a hotbed for jazz. There are no cowboys in Deadwood. And you begin to explore this and then compare this to other cities. Uh, if we do more cross-cultural comparison, a compare uh, Plattsburgh, New York, to what's going on in uh, uh, someplace in Indiana and in the, in the Sioux Falls, and you begin to see the differences and the similarities. And I think that to, to, to get caught up in the broad looking for the core values of the Midwest and the core cultural concerns uh, uh, deflects from really understanding uh, that, uh, uh, conservatism, another great idea. Okay. <clears throat> South Dakota's basic political tradition was not conservative, it was progressive. J Janklow, the late uh, B William Janklow was the last progressive. He's a Republican, of course. Uh, and if you want in, in, in any detail, then you begin to see, well, what were the subcultures of, of the politics? And how did it change from a, a Jankel Republican who is pro-active uh, 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 government uh, for the common good to the kind of uh, political culture you see now, uh, which is not conservative in any meaningful sense. Uh, uh, I don't think that uh, uh, you see a much of Burke in South Dakota uh, politics. Well, can we, uh, can we, I, we almost need to, to leave. So I, I wanted to hear Andrew Klump's question if we could before we go. Oh, uh, sure. I was just going to drop it in the chat. Um, thanks okay. for, I, thanks for seeing that. Um, I guess my question is related to the other chat questions um, is how we often think about the Midwest in relationship to the East, but what does it really look like if we center the Midwest looking North, East, Southwest and across all these oceans? Um, so I'm thinking at like the Dutch communities that often reference Amsterdam and Abraham Kuyper more than they would reference say New York or Yale um, or the transcendental meditation movement with roots in Iowa that's gonna be referencing South Asian thought, that kind of thing. So are there even more possibilities in intellectual history um, if we start stop using the, the East as our primary counterpoint, but also start looking at this really dynamic web? And I offered that with a minute left, so no expectation for, for answers. And I know that's probably another volume, but that's really what was going on. And there's a, some great questions about the South too, that I think could be really dynamic, especially on those borders, border, border regions. Thank you so much. Well, uh, a recent book that, um that many of you may know, uh, it does a lot with, with Canada, with the, the borderlands uh, of Canada. It's um, uh, The Heartland by um, Kristen Hoganson. Um, you know, so I, I think that that remains uh, a territory to also be explored. Um, but yes, uh, pivoting, not, not just creating that binary of the Midwest and the East, I, I think is, is great.
the whole Appalachian issue is front and center with Hillbilly Elegy and Vance, of course, very controversial book, but uh, seems very, you know, located in Ohio, <laughs> but pitched as Appalachian. But yeah. I mean, the South is so distinctive. I mean, it's, it's hard to draw those connections, Michael. And the warmth of other suns um, and number of books about the diaspora northward from not just, you know, hillbillies, whites, and uh, African Americans. Trying to remember, uh, there are a number of books, but it, it's so important to see these migration flows into the Midwest from Appalachia, white Southern, and black um, throughout much of the 20th century. Speaking of which, a new Richard White Wright uh, novel is just uh, published. Uh, oh my God! Yes, yes. So um, one of those uh, migrants up from the south with um, very mixed feelings. Very, very mixed feelings. Yes. Yeah. How often do you get a, a Richard Wright novel? Uh, a new one. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for, for coming. Yes. Great. Thanks, everybody. Okay. We'll see you soon. We'll see you in person Thank next you. year. Okay. <laughs> Bye, John. See ya. Thanks, John. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, John. All and the participants. Great participation. Liz. Thank you. Thank you. See you, Paul. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Paul.